Good morning. Hi there. How are you guys? Dr. Good Fazalat, to see you, Dr. Bobby, Dr. good to see you. Good to see you. Sorry to interrupt, it's okay. but okay. it's time for our interview. Okay. Fantastic. All right. right. Okay, so I'm going to leave um, this couple forms for you to sign. Great. And I'm going to go give shots to the patient. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so okay. much. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Bobby. We'll see you later. Yep. Well, I'd like to welcome our viewers to this episode of Health Connections on KCAT Television, Los Gatos Montesoreno. I'm Dr. Stuart Miniker from the Palo Alto Medical Foundation, Los Gatos Clinic. I'm here today with my wonderful colleague, Dr. Rebecca Fazalat from our Department of Pediatrics. Hi there. Now today's episode is a little different from many of our others where we've talked primarily about medical issues. Today we're going to talk about the life of a doctor. And we have one of my favorite doctors to talk with about how her life goes and why she likes being a doctor. Let's start at the beginning of the day. I'd like to know how your day goes along. So what time do you have to wake up? So typically I start my day early. I want to make sure that I get things done at home that need to be done so my kids are settled for school. So I usually get up around six, do work around the house, get my kids up and ready for school, and generally speaking make it to the office by about eight o'clock. And what do you do first when you get here? So the first thing I do is I sit down with my assistant and we look at the day really important for me and I know for her to have a grasp on what we think is going to be coming in the door so we can prepare. And sometimes that includes going through and reviewing charts ahead of time. Sometimes it's her and I having a conversation. What has happened recently with this patient? Why are they coming back? I haven't seen this one in a while. What could have gone on? But there's a lot of pre-planning that goes into our day and anticipation of what could come. I also look at the work that she has put aside for me from the day before or maybe a little bit longer and what needs to be done. What's my priority to get through in the day? So we really plan that day together. So you work closely as a team. Yes. And I think probably uh, most parents and kids and other patients who see their doctor realize that doctors are part of a team here at the clinic. But many people may not realize how much planning you do for each and every visit. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely could not underscore how important that planning is and having that relationship with the people you work with so that you can talk about the patients and all of those intricate details that really make a difference in their care. We don't just walk into a room blind, not knowing you know what's ahead of us. Sometimes there's information we don't expect, but if we can be as prepared as we can, it definitely is helpful for me, and I am hopeful that that's helpful for the patients as well. I think it probably makes a difference. Tell me, Rebecca, who else is on your team? I mean, we met Fabi when I came in, and she's obviously a, your amazing assistant you've worked with for a long time. Yep. She's clearly part of your team, but yep. who else here at the office works on the team with you to take care of our patients? There's a number of people that work in the office. There's a physician team, so we all help each other. We have difficult patients, difficult cases, we're running behind, we need help. We all work to support each other. Absolutely, the medical assistants are an integral part of our day-to-day, -day, getting patients in room, giving our vaccines. We also have nurses who are part of our team at different, different levels of nursing that do different things. We have an advice nurse team who works solely on answering messages, phone messages, email messages from our patients. We have a management team that helps tie everybody together and make sure that everybody can get done what they can most efficiently with the patient in the center of all of those conversations. That's just the in-office team and then the teams obviously go beyond this office in the organization to help make our care synchronous. For me, working at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation and hopefully for our patients, being part of a team with a lot of resources to support mm -hmm. us is, it's wonderful. Yeah. It makes taking care of people easier, yeah. uh, more efficient, more effective. I agree, completely. We talked a little bit about the team and you're here and uh, you've reviewed your day. Now Fabi goes out to get to your first patient. Is it time to have a cup of coffee or what do you do next? I usually have my cup of coffee on the way to work. <laughs> no time once I get here, no, I'm teasing. Um, yeah, I usually have that by my side, but Typically, she'll room my first patient, and then I just get going with my day. And actually, from there, it goes by very quickly because it's in and out of patient rooms. It's on the computer, doing charting, answering e-messages, phone calls in between patients, doing the paperwork that needs to get done. And it's really a hustle and bustle until lunchtime when I like to take a nice break. What kind of patients do you see? So I see all sorts of patients, but I'm a pediatrician, so obviously it's limited with the age group. Usually we see kids from birth until about age 18. And I might see kids there here for healthy checkups, 
sports physicals. I might also see kids here who are for urgent problems. They might have fallen and hurt, hurt themselves. They might have behavioral or social issues, school issues that the parents want to talk to me about. So it can be a variety of different things for my day. And some days are heavier. In the summertime, we tend to see more checkups. Mm -hmm. In the winter, we tend to see more sick kids. So there is some sort of variation in how that day plays out, just depending on the season. I imagine in between patients, you're checking on those messages yeah. and things. How much time does that take? I mean, are you spending 10 minutes with a patient in an exam room and then five minutes on the phone with somebody, dad, and then uh, emailing a mom? And how does all that work? So I try to be very mindful of patients' time. And when they're here, I don't like to keep patients waiting in the room to be seen, nor do I want to be running behind. But there is that work that needs to be done in between seeing patients. So it's really dependent on the situation. If it's a quick email question you know, that I can answer very quickly, one or two minutes in between patient encounters, I will do that. If there's a more delicate conversation that needs to happen with a family, if they're worried, again, about a school issue, a behavioral issue, I'll try to save those longer 15, 20 minute conversations to the end of the day or to lunchtime when I have time to really focus on it. But I do try to get through two, three, five minutes in between each patient to just chip away at the work that needs to be done. Nor do I want to keep people waiting for the phone call about their lab results, the e-message about their next trip and prevention on the vacation. So I try to keep things moving along. And I imagine Fabi helps you decide what to address? How yes, does that work? absolutely. So Fabi will tee things up um, as a way to put it. She'll let me know when I come in in between patients want to let you know that there's a message from Mrs. Jones in your inbox and she really needs to hear from you in the next hour. She can't just, she's not sure if she needs to come in for an appointment um, today. So she'll let me know or I, I penned it a refill for you and we need to get that done right away. This child is having an asthmatic problem and needs the inhaler. So she'll let me know what those priorities are. If they're all equal, then I'll decide for myself as I go through. But she definitely alerts me to the high priority forms, phone calls, emails issues that come up. Another thing uh, you haven't mentioned so far that I know that you and your team work on is we have uh, patients who come in for nurse visits. Yes. But they it's not just the nurse who takes care of everything. How do you help uh, on those nurse visits? Yeah, so it, it's, it depends. It depends on the day, but most of the time they're coming in for vaccines. So it's really important for the physician to verify what vaccines are needed to be given at that visit that those are appropriate, we sign off on them and then we verify the shot that's being given at the time. So we do actually participate in those visits mm -hmm. quite a bit. You know, if you have a nurse who's given a million shots in her career, why do you as a doctor have to verify they're giving the shot that they say they're giving? So I think we take safety as a number one priority in this organization and we certainly allow people to operate within the scope of their practice. So if somebody has that scope of practice where they can verify a vaccine, we absolutely allow them to do that with the education needed. But we also have other folks in this organization who need that support of a physician. And because safety is such a priority here and to err is human, we know that having checks and balances is really important. And I would say that's definitely an organizational priority that you can see at that granular level, really when we're giving a vaccine. Mm -hmm. Well, that brings me to uh, another important question I have for you that many of your patients or our viewers might wonder about is, at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation, a very large number of our physicians are in leadership uh, and planning roles. And Dr. Fazalot is one of those. Yeah. So uh, in the past, when I've had patients know that I do leadership work in addition to seeing patients, they've always wondered why? Mm -hmm. And maybe using the example mm -hmm. of verifying vaccines, mm -hmm. you could help explain mm -hmm. that to our viewers. Yeah, absolutely. I have always had an interest in impacting patients' lives in a way beyond just our one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversation and um, collaboration. And I think one of the great ways to do that is to get involved in some of the leadership efforts that our organization offers. Mm -hmm. This allows me to impact more patients over a broader scope and help the organization run in a way that is smooth for the staff, the patients, the physicians, and everyone can work together. So being involved in those opportunities allows me to affect more people, reduce the variability of the way that we do things in our clinic, and really have a more collaborative approach to patient care. And I appreciate being able to do that at this organization. Yeah, it's wonderful that we have physicians like you being team leaders 
for all of us. So Dr. Fazalat is perhaps the leader of the team taking care of our patients with Fabi and the other nurses here, but also within our building here in Los Gatos and in the larger Palo Alto Medical Foundation. She does a lot of leadership that helps us function better as a team, constantly trying to improve what we do. Always. And we really appreciate that. It's wonderful having Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. You told us a little bit about why you wanted to be a leader, but we skipped over, why did you want to be a doctor? You know, I think about that and I get asked that question often by patients, in particular children who are thinking about medicine mm -hmm. already. You know, five, six-year-olds who wonder, <laughs> what? why did you choose it's this? It's adorable, yes. So I try to think back to what, what was it? And I think there were a number of different things that led me to this choice. When I was young, my mom was actually a midwife, a lay midwife and birth educator. So I was around birth and home births mm -hmm. as a very young child and had opportunity to see medicine in that regard. So I felt very comfortable with the body, how it worked, and the idea of getting to participate in the care of a patient and a process. And birth obviously is so exciting, yeah. was, was my lure um, in. We, I did not grow up in a physician family, so I really had no idea what that looked like from the other side, actually living. As a, as a doctor, so I spent a lot of time in my younger years when I thought, was, when I fantasized about what it would be like to be a doctor, I spent time with family friends who were doctors, mm -hmm. talked to them a lot, what was it like, and I was really intrigued by the physiology of the body, getting to work one-on-one -on -one with somebody to impact their life in a really positive way, but also just understanding giving back. So I wanted to do something where I could utilize knowledge that was uh, important to me, biology, physiology, the way the body worked, but also be able to impact the community in some way, and those things tied really nicely together for medicine. But I didn't really decide to do it until college, and I still felt like I needed to make sure that this was the path for me, knowing that once I was in, I was going to be all in. Yeah. So, took a while. <laughs> It's a long process of decision making. Yeah. Well, so you decided to be a doctor. Why not an obstetrician who delivers babies? You had this great example from your mom and yeah. it's exciting and newborns are cute and pink and cuddly <laughs> and soft and... Well, exactly, which is why I'm happy to accept them after <laughs> delivery. You can no, do without the blood and guts and just take yeah. the baby part. You know, <laughs> I think, and that's in the training, having exposure to all the different fields. I really went in with an open mind. I didn't go in saying, I want to be an OB, I want to be a pediatrician. And I tried through my rotations to find the people with which I felt the most comfortable. Mm -hmm. and felt like I commu could communicate with best. So I really felt like I was at home in my pediatric rotations. I really felt like I understood the people I was working with. I love communicating with the children. Mm -hmm. They're just so raw and open and they'll tell you anything and I appreciate that so much. So as much as I love the deliveries, I love being on the accepting end mm -hmm. <laughs> rather than during and that just, it definitely has, I feel really good about my choice in uh, careers within medicine, I think this is, this is the right fit for me. I think your patients would say the same thing. I yeah. hope so. Yeah. Well, you mentioned communicating with kids. What about the ones who can't communicate? How do you manage that? Well, I think that's sometimes the most exciting because it's definitely like detective work. So we're looking for clues and watching and observing the children and how they behave while you either talk to their parents or examine them, can often give you clues to what's going on. And then really having that open mind when talking with the family and trying to understand, they are trying to figure out also what's happening with their child. And so getting those clues from them about what things have changed, I find that exciting and fun. And you know, it, it's challenging at times, but I definitely think there's some fun involved in that as well, because it is like being a detective. I think a lot of physicians uh, think of their job as a little bit of detective work. Yeah. Don't you ever like have issues with the parents and their expectations or needs in the exam room? Is that ever tough? tough? I love all my families mm -hmm. and I love working with them and they are all very different. So there are definitely times where my families um, that I'm working with and me, we don't always we're not always uh, seeing eye to eye, and I really work hard to try to figure out why we're not meeting in the middle and how we can communicate better, because it's really about me understanding what their need is. So even if my expectation is different than theirs, I really have to come to a place of understanding why they're there, 
and how I can help them get their needs met. And it may be that I can't meet that need, but I can certainly get them to someone who can. But digging deeper into that conversation, uh, it's not hard, but I think it takes time and patience. And I know my families deserve that, and I try to give them that. And if we don't necessarily make that in the office, sometimes I'll think in my mind, gosh, I wonder if this family is still wondering if that was exactly what they needed, and I'll call them and reach out to them and see if we can communicate better. So that piece is hard sometimes. It's great to hear you talk about uh, taking care of folks and the care and thought you put into even those folks where you're trying to understand what they want, what they need, and it's not necessarily matching up right. with your thoughts about how things should be going. That's an excellent example of why you're such a fabulous doctor and also why you make such a wonderful leader in our organization. I think that Dr. Fazalat's a great example of how we at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation realize that some of our patients come to us when they're not at their best. Uh, and it's really our honor and privilege to help them through tough times. And uh, we do what we can to set aside our own feelings about yeah. uh, how people may be speaking, the mood they're in, mm -hmm. how they respond to us, and focus on what is the need here, mm -hmm. because that's really our job. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. You know, one thing that um, I think some patients are a little uncomfortable with and some doctors may be uncomfortable mm -hmm. with, but I know you've mastered in your bedside manner is things have changed since we first entered medicine and we have a computer in every exam room. Yeah. How do you deal with that? So I have tried early on to use the computer in the room in such a way that it doesn't interfere uh, with the conversation that I'm having with the family or the patient, but keeping in mind that it has all of their health information on it. So it is really an important part of our visit to incorporate it. So I, the way I have my room set up, I actually type while my patient or their parent is speaking to me and I tell them, I'm going to open up your medical record and I'm going to take some notes so that I don't miss anything. And I think that's really important for me to capture everything that they're saying at the time that they're saying it so that I don't lose those really important details that are important for their health. I also use the computer to show them things. We review the last year for them, what they've, their child has come in for, we look at their medicines together, we look at the growth charts together. So I try to involve them with the record, so it's not just me and the computer against them. It's really a part of, the computer is part of our team. The medical right. record really is part of our team. Sure. So I try to incorporate that. Periodically I do have to tell them, I'm going to turn away from you for a second because I need to check something on here. Give me a moment. And I want them to know that that pause and me diverting my eyes from them is not to exclude them. It's so that I need to take a moment and document something really important. I think that's a great way to put it. I've, I've never heard someone say the computer's part of the team. But that's what I hope yep. our patients will understand the yep. value of the computer in our process. Definitely. Now, some of us who are a little bit older and uh, maybe not as dexterous as Rebecca, have to think, take notes on paper, and then type later. Mm -hmm. So I can't really type very well when my patient's talking to me, but it is very important to try to get the information yeah. as soon as possible yeah. after the visit. Absolutely. So I tend to do that between patients. And I think that's okay. I think we are all different, and allowing those differences, that makes your flow better with your patients. This works for me and I actually love that we can have those differences. And I don't think that that's a negative impact on patients at all. I think it's really positive. We can both do what works best for us. Well, what are some other changes in medicine that's happened in the years since you've been a physician, since you were in medical school, that have affected you and your patients the way you practice medicine, besides having the computer in the room? There have been so many changes yeah. over time. I think, you know, when I went through medical school and in residency and even had my first job outside of residency, we all had a lot more separate private practices. Mm -hmm. There weren't as many group practices and I came from the East Coast where the only large organization was one big medical group. There weren't separate multi-specialty groups around. And when I moved back to the Bay Area, I was very excited to actually join a multi-specialty group because I saw that medicine was evolving and communication between primary care doctors and their specialists was very important for patients. 
And for me, coming from a very small private practice where I didn't know the specialists in my community well, I could still pick up the phone and call them, but I didn't have a way to share information with them because we all had paper records. We would just, over phone calls, talk about patient cases, and I saw the downside of that. So I think that the organized medical groups in the area is definitely one of the larger changes that I've seen and have been a part of. And that part for me has allowed me, I think, to deliver a higher level of care for my patients. Mm -hmm. Just having that communication ability between a specialist maybe in Mountain View or Palo Alto about a patient I'm seeing in Los Gatos, that's something I couldn't have done you know, 10, 15 years ago in practice. And nor would I have known what was happening to them in the hospital because the medical record in the hospital didn't talk to our paper chart, but now it all talks through the computer. Mm -hmm. So it definitely has built more challenges in, but I think for the patients on the back end in terms of taking care of them well, I've seen that as probably the biggest change, just sort of the organization of medical care and delivery. Mm -hmm. and You've like, given me a little bit different perspective. I was thinking, you know, CAT scans, MRIs, all those all kinds that too. of things. Technology. And there is all that too, but <laughs> I, think group medical practice is a huge innovation in medicine in the last uh, 15, 20 years yeah. that uh, I would agree is very valuable for our patients. Absolutely. We've talked a little bit about how you start your day, uh, patient visits, and things you do to help improve care, working with Fabi and the rest of the team. It's the end of the morning. Do you sit at your desk and scribble and, you know, try to gulp down the lunch really quickly or, or how do you take your break midday? I actually think it's really important to take a step away from the office when I can. And some days my patients really need me to be completing tasks at lunchtime and I do find a way to eat. But if I ever have opportunity to actually step out of the office, get a breath of fresh air, just recharge myself in a more private setting where I don't have questions coming at me constantly, I find that very valuable. And sometimes that's alone, sometimes that's with a colleague. Mm -hmm. Just time to catch up on life and think about something outside of the grind of the work of the day. Fits right in with, I'm sure, uh, some of the advice you give to moms and dads yep. with little babies at Definitely. home who are demanding and crying. That's how we say, you know, sometimes you have to put yep. your kid in there, in their day bed and step out and yep. close the door and take a brief take bake. A minute. So that brings us back to work. You've had your break, yep. you're re-energized. Yep. I assume you meet with Fabi again to yes. prepare for the afternoon. Yes. And is there usually a big difference between your afternoon and your morning in clinic? Not necessarily. I mean, it's variable on the day, but we have a really similar type of reconnection. You know, what has changed for the afternoon schedule? What things are left undone from the morning? What do we need to make sure to complete before either of us leave the office that day? So we sort of re-huddle, re-discuss, and then get moving. And uh, how late does your day go? You said you come to the office by eight. Yeah. How late does your day normally go when you're seeing patients all day? So usually I'll see patients until about five o'clock and then there's paperwork to be done after that. And that's the finishing up of the forms and the refills and the messages and the phone calls and all of that work try to get done. And I try to leave the office by 5.30 mm -hmm. so that I can be home for dinner. We saw that Fabi left you a, a Yes, she has a list of things to done. do. Always, <laughs> always something to do. So you get home at 5.30 and yeah. you know, you're a mom and a spouse again. Exactly, and then there's dinner to be made, there's homework to be done, there's sports to go to. Um, there's lots of stuff that happens in the evening and sometimes it's a really blissful time with my kids, <laughs> but anyone who's a parent knows it's not always not that always. way, and that's okay. Dr. Fazelot has three beautiful children and uh, they're all just as bright and smart as she is, and I know they're gonna be a wonderful part of our community as they grow up with yeah. a great mom. How do you balance being a mom and being a doctor? I think I have learned to accept that balance is not always perfect and actually being imbalanced with children is okay. So I go back and forth between putting a little bit more emphasis on my time with family, sometimes work requires more emphasis, and being accepting of not being perfect um, has helped me over these last several years. My oldest is now 13 and I definitely didn't know that in the beginning and I worked really hard to create what I thought would be a perfect balance and really just accepting that life is chaotic and busy and everything is actually my balance. Well, without being too intrusive, I'd like to ask about 
you, you know, your relationship and your kids, you talked mm -hmm. about mom being mm -hmm. a lay midwife and mm -hmm. how that influenced mm -hmm. you. What, what do your kids say to you about being mm -hmm. a doctor? I mean, yeah. I, it, you know, self-disclosure, my son who's a teenager says, I would never be a doctor, you work too hard. What do your kids say to you? They are still young enough to think that it's a great choice. It's cool. It's, still. it's cool. <laughs> it's cool. Mom and dad are cool, um, but they Your actually. Your husband's a physician. My husband's too, a surgeon, surgeon, and so they actually tell me how they're going to be surgeons. Huh. And although my daughter says she'd like to be a pediatrician to come work with me. Oh, how nice! Yeah, which is really nice. But they still, I think, they are intrigued by it. Mm -hmm. I think they find some of the medicine actually interesting. They'll ask me, did you have any interesting patients today? They will literally ask me this. How, and I'll tell them sometimes I'm really affected by a sick patient and I have one particular child I've cared for who has a lot of me, uh, really serious medical problems and who's probably living on borrowed time and it really affects me emotionally when he's hospitalized or his parent is having trouble and they'll ask me how's that little boy doing they don't know his name they don't know anything mm -hmm. they just know that emotionally I'm invested in his care and they'll say is he okay How, when was the last time he went to the hospital you know did he get to take a trip with his family this summer mm -hmm. so they see the other side of it and they know when I'm worrying about a patient and need to even step away from dinner and take a phone call call the hospital check in on someone and they're very actually respectful of that and I think they can relate to it on some level mm -hmm. No surprise that you're raising compassionate kids. Do you have help around the house or, I mean, you were in a, a two working parent household, so yeah. how does all that work? Yeah, I am definitely a believer in the notion that it takes a village to raise a family. And I'm lucky and very blessed to be in a community where my parents are local, my husband's parents are local, my sister is local, my husband, sister, and brother are local, and we all help each other out with our families. I am so grateful to the grandparents, the nannies, the babysitters, the friends who help me with my kids and with my life, and I think it makes their life richer. And it certainly, from my side, I could not do it with all the help that I have. Let me ask, what do you recommend to parents of the children you mm -hmm. see in your practice mm -hmm. who don't have a village. Mm -hmm. How can other folks get the support in raising their kids? I think it's important to find that village. I do think that they exist. It doesn't have to be your family, but I think it's really important for parents in particular while the kids are little to have a support network in place. And I often talk to new moms, new dads about finding those people in their community that they can connect with. There's so many issues that come up when you're raising a child that you're not sure about, you need support with, and having just a group of people to support you, whether it be at the school, at the church, through a local volunteer organization, those are usually the types of things that help parents feel connected and not so alone in their journey. That's very important. And I'd like to say to our viewers that I hope that all of you will think of us here at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation as part of your village. So Dr. Fazalat and I both see children in our practices, and we as doctors are always available to you if you have questions about your children, their health, and even some mental health issues or helping to develop a support mm -hmm. network, as yeah. Dr. Fazalat has mentioned. So please be sure to include your doctor as part of the group helping you to raise your kids. How yeah. often do you have to take call or work late uh, on an evening clinic or a, a weekend clinic? Yeah, so we take call about twice a month uh, during the week, and then we do a weekend every six to eight weeks. And the on-call usually is not a huge burden, to be honest. I think that we're really lucky to be in a group where we get support made by our nursing staff to answer mm -hmm. a lot of phone calls for us, which I think everyone can relate to being worried about a child who has a fever in the evening and needing to have a dose of medicine. So of typically those things are handled by somebody else, but if somebody's in the hospital or there's a more serious problem, I need to stop what I'm doing and address that patient and call them. On the weekends, we also have clinics on Saturdays and Sundays, and we all take turns staffing that clinic where we see lots of different patients. We'll see newborns who can't wait you know, for the week to come to be seen. And then we also will see some healthy checkups and some sick kids as well. In pediatrics, we know definitely that time is really important. And when you're worried about your sick child, there's nothing worse than waiting for an appointment. Right. So we try to do what we can to accommodate. And that means having those hours and that avail availability to really give support to the families. Speaking of babies who don't wait, we haven't talked about 
taking care of newborns at the hospital mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. I know you do that. Yep. We sort of have just talked about clinic stuff. So yeah. please tell me a little bit more about how you and your team take care of babies sure. when they arrive. So it's again another example of how we try to collaborate and work together as a team, much like we do in the office. We take turns going to the hospital in the morning prior to seeing patients mm -hmm. on those days and we'll see the newborns that are in the hospital. We currently serve one hospital, but depending on where you work, you might visit multiple hospitals. In the early stages of my career, I would round at three different hospitals before coming to clinic by eight o'clock. Wow. <laughs> so there were some <laughs> early mornings there. But I think that is an important part of the patient care piece for us. This is where it all begins. Mm -hmm. We get to connect with those families on in a really personal time for them. I mean, it's such an amazing gift to have a baby and get to share that experience and then welcome them into our clinic or to one of our partner clinics. A lot of patients we see don't necessarily come see us in the office, but they may see one of our partners in one of the other divisions of our clinic and we're happy to provide that care and service. It's fun too. It's really right. fun. Yeah, newborns are the best. So it's evening, hopefully the kids are in bed and yes. staying there. Yes. <laughs> Usually. How much sleep do you get at night for yourself? <laughs> sleep is one of those commodities <laughs> I think any physician will tell you they could use more. It's, it's again, it's very variable. I think in general probably six to seven hours a night is pretty typical for me. Um, on the weekends I splurge a little bit and get more. Uh, but I'm also one of those people who doesn't, I don't think I need terribly lot of sleep and I feel really blessed to have that mm -hmm. genetically I think um, so I try to get what I can but usually six to seven here's the family doctor taking care of someone <laughs> in me when do you exercise so I would say the exercise that I do now is really built into my life I'm very active in the office I am moving up and down the hallways quickly I'm not sedentary at my desk all day so I get a lot of activity that's not separate exercise, it's just part of my daily life. Mm -hmm. And even at home, the laundry, the tidying, the cooking, that's my exercise. Uh -huh. I do set aside some time on the weekends to take the dog for a walk, do a little bit of Pilates in my living room, a little bit of weights here and there. But honestly, right now, I think that I live a more active lifestyle mm -hmm. and don't have set aside gym or exercise time I just try to incorporate it into my daily life. The laundry is very heavy, it turns out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to thank my guest today, Dr. Rebecca Fazalat from the Department of Pediatrics here at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation Los Gatos Center. I hope you've all learned a little bit about the life of a physician, one of our best, and learned a little bit about how we prepare ourselves to help take care of you, both at the local level when we see you as our patients or your children every day, but also how important it is at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation that we have leaders like Dr. Fazala to help us all do better taking care of all of our patients. It's really a wonderful organization to work for with leadership like Dr. Fazala, and I hope you've all learned a little bit about that today. We'll look forward to seeing you again here on Health Connections, KCAT Television, Los Gatos, Montes Reno.